What is up, my friends? In this video, I actually have a good friend, Mandy Ellison from handsoffceo.com, joining me for an in depth interview on her new book, Hands Off CEO. We've been friends for a while now, and we actually both serve agencies, consultants, and service providers. Although we typically focus on folks that are below a million, her clients are typically above a million and typically sell like six figure contracts and above. And so they're typically working with larger businesses. And so we have a really great conversation around how to remove yourself from your business at different stages, what holds you as an agency owner back from growth and scalability and profitability. It's a deep dive interview that I hope you enjoy. So check it out and let us know your biggest takeaway in the comments below. Mandy, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Greg. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So for those of you listening and watching, Mandy and I have known each other for a handful of years now, and I had the opportunity to just be on on her show. We get along really, really well because we talk about a lot of the same things around productization, scaling, making more while working less, removing yourself from operations, the day-to-day, increasing profits, all of these things. And we both work with fundamentally similar audiences outside of the fact that as of, I don't know how long ago, but we realized that the, the the big distinction is that a lot of Mandy's clients are already above seven figures and scaling and also deal typically with like a lot larger deals, whereas our clients are usually pre 1 million and usually serve like small to medium sized businesses, other B2B type folks. So we're going to jam on a handful of things around being hands off which, you know, her brand as I alluded already is hands off CEO. You have a new book coming out. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank you. Here's kind of where I want to start. I'd love to, like, you've been in the game for a long time, and a lot of the folks watching this, as you know, agencies, consultants, service providers, they might resonate with all of those terms. Freelancer, throw all of that in there. And there is this, if you scroll at all through the internet for a second, you'll see like how to make X dollars. The business runs without you. There's a lot of the escape the day to day. Your brand is around hands off. Can you talk about where people have maybe like the mindset around becoming a hands off CEO, where people fall short on that, or maybe they're misunderstanding what you actually mean when you say hands off? Oh, that, that, that is a great question. And um, I was just chatting with a consulting company CEO on LinkedIn yesterday, just like, I love the part that you're talking about with the profits, but like, I don't know that I want to be hands off. The thing is, is that there is, there is a reluctance to be hands off. And one of the biggest reasons why is because there's not a safe way for us to do it until we put some of the foundations in place. The CEO that I was mentioning, actually, he, he is wise to not let go too early at, at a place where things are not, they don't, he doesn't have the foundations in place. He doesn't have a team in place. And the reality is it takes something to put those things in place. A lot of the, that dialogue that's out there on the market, and I don't know if you agree with me on this or not, Greg, but the way I see it is a lot of it is for like, it's it's like the the kind of four hour work week type of mindset where you, where you go and sit on the beach and um, sip your Mai Tai and you have all this, this passive products. And it kind of feels to me like a lot of it's like cheating the business game in a way where they're not providing a lot of value. They're just looking at how do we, it's, it's the same game that we're seeing with like the chat GPT. How do we create a business out of chat GPT? Right, just like, right. It's really more like, how do you scam enough people to be able to make money without, you know, without actually putting your together a real business model around it? So our approach to hands-off growth is it's very much having the foundations in place, the pricing structures. One of the big things that we help our clients do is increase their prices 300% or more. That's even if they're selling six figure deals already. You know, we have clients that have, have gone from selling lower six figure deals to seven figure deals. We've had clients who've gone from, you know, maybe they're $50,000 a year um, services, or maybe they're, they're $20,000 packages here and there. And then we, they go from that to $120,000 package over a year. And right. you know what that gives them is that consistency, that consistent revenue flow, the additional profitability, and it allows them to be able to hire the people to do the good quality work. So that's one of the foundational pieces in place, but there are things that have to be put in place to be able to really enjoy that lifestyle, especially once you've built a, a business where you're, you're generating results for clients, you, you, um, you're doing good work, but you have to find a way to be able to scale yourself out of it so that you're actually adding more value to clients, not adding less, which right. is usually where a lot of people scale. Yeah. And I, I would say that I overall agree with kind of the stuff that we see inside the marketplace, you know, online as you scroll through, especially in the area where my quote unquote kind of competition, if you will, or alternatives to what we do. I don't know if it's the size of business 
necessarily, or if it's just these more like business opportunity type offers that lean into that being the outcome of like the business runs without you. But it does seem like, I mean, I talk to people that as you've alluded to, there's a lot of things that need to be put in place for it even to run without you, even parts of specific departments for the day to day. And the vision of these people going from 25K a month to even 100K a month and literally not be involved in the business at all is what they're like, their idea is. And I'm like, you're not getting it. (laughs) Like, and so I was just wondering, like, even if even at the seven figure level, do you get people that when they think hands off, they just want this thing to run without them, and they don't have to be involved at all, or that they think that can happen like in 90 days? (laughs) I think by the time you're at seven figures, people are have tried enough things, and they bang their head against the wall enough times to recognize that that's not going to happen. I think one of the bigger challenges that we've run into is for them to actually believe that it's possible for their type of business, because the the typical ways of scaling a service, they don't work for the high level boutique type of services where we're helping our clients, where they're generating high six figure and seven figure impact for their clients. That is Mm. something that's very difficult to scale because oftentimes as foundation, it's built upon the expertise of the CEO, of the founder of the company. You know, when you're looking at 20, 30 years of experience that are from interdisciplinaries, different industries, it's a conglomeration that is totally unique to them and their skill set. So how do you be able to scale that? Well, you can't actually scale that, but there is a way to be able to scale a product line, a service line that elevates it as the very best in the industry. And most people don't think it's possible because the prevailing scaling models out there do not address this problem. They just say you need to productize it down, which is not a bad thing. And I know that's something that you teach. That is a way to scale, but it, yeah. it does not work for, you know, some of the, some of the clients that, you know, we've, we've worked with some clients that you say, okay, these aren't a good fit for us. And, you know, vice versa, it doesn't work as well. There are certain levels of when you're selling $500,000 deals or a million dollar deals, yeah. or even a hundred thousand dollar deals, how you be able to scale that takes some more nuance. Totally. But it can be done and it can be an, ex- an incredibly profitable business model. Question. So one of the things that I've said a lot and coming from my background of like, I've worked for agencies that were subsets of like Omnicom, like as we call them traditional agencies, where like they were designed back in the day as fundamentally these full on outsourced departments. When I was at Tracy Locke, which was, you know, a promotional in-store marketing for Pepsi, Unilever, multi-millions, like eight, nine figures in revenue a year, they still had like less than 20 clients, big, high tick, high value per client. And one mistake that I see for people coming into our world is like, maybe that left that they come in like, oh, we're going to be like that, but we're going to charge like $2,000 a month retainers, which obviously doesn't really work. So I was curious, like when we talk about scale, right? Like I think a lot of people define scale differently. And so when your clients are saying scale, what does that look like? for them? Like how, how are you guys defining that? And kind of in there is like, are most of your people still like, are they hundreds? Like if they're doing a hundred, a hundred thousand dollar deal or even half a million dollar deal, like I'm guessing that they don't have thousands of clients. They have like, like they have like dozens and they don't. And what it oftentimes look like is that they have like, you know, two or three of these high level clients, they have the ability to sell like a hundred thousand dollar deal, or it may be the way that they're looking at it is $9,000 or $20,000 a month. And it's like on a monthly ongoing, which has its own concerns there, because, you know, if you have a $20,000 a month client, you have all these teams that's supporting that. And if it's on a month to month, most of the time they're on net 30, (laughs) which is after you've already done the work. So you're looking at like 60 days to get paid for the work that you've already paid someone to do. There's some cash flow problems right there. And those are one of the, actually, those are one of the biggest things that we see change on like session one, working with our clients where um, we've had clients be able to go and collect on like $300,000 of cash collections. They were liabilities and they didn't even see it that way. And when right. you, by the way, going into a recession, one of the last things you want financially, you really want to be at a place where you can have the, the consistency and, and the repeatability with clients. Now, a lot of people talk about that as like a retainer, but here's the thing is, is that clients don't really like the term retainer that much, unless you, you can really put something around it that is juicy and that is very tangible that they see mm. why. 
why are we having a year long, two year long? How like this, these agreements, how do you be able to get clients locked into these agreements? There's a lot of agencies that will pride themselves on and we don't lock you into any agreements. So I was like, well, that's great. That might be good for your clients. And they, they're excited about that. But is it really good for your clients though? If you're planning with them on a month to month basis, then you're, you're looking at very short term feedback loops. You're not looking at like, what is the best thing that we could be doing for your company over the next three years, for example? What is this right. growth path? That you go That's from, yeah. you know, like one of our one of our clients in the financial space, they realized they were doing a lot of operational consulting with with part of what they were doing too. But really, they were helping them deal with some of the scale issues that they run into at 20 million and helping them get to 50 million. So mm-hmm. the offer is now we're going to be helping you get from 20 million to 50 million in a matter of three years. That is a reason to go in and say, I'm going for this program. I want this program to get me there. But you're not yeah, going to get yeah. there by just doing the, like the monthly types of thing. You have to have a bigger vision. And that's how you actually train your team on the bigger vision too. Your team needs something to actually manage to. So when a client comes to you and they use the word scale, like, I guess, yeah, like, do they define that by a certain percentage of growth? Are they like, when they say scale, do they really mean they want to exit? What's their interpretation of scale? And then what is yours? And does that always align? I'm really glad you asked that question again, because I realized I didn't quite fully answer that question. (laughs) It's okay. So <laughs> I went off on my tangent. All right. The scale, that, that is a really fun term. The new guys will use, I want to scale my company. It's like, no, you want to grow your company. Very different thing. But uh, scale is really about being able to generate more growth with the same resources or without the same amount of resources as you're growing. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. That is, um, and that's something that I, I talk about in, in um, my new book, The Hands Off CEO. So it's, it's about being able to grow beyond the CEO. And I think that's what a lot of the kind of clients that we're looking at, that we, that we work with, define scale as, as being able to grow beyond them and to be able to grow in a way that, that they're not working 60, 70 hours per week. That's yeah. not scaling. That's just generating more growth than the, the amount of time, yeah. the hours. It's, it's a time for money model. So to be able to get the true scale, we have to actually remove the CEO off this time for money model. So what does that look to answer your question? For some mm-hmm. people that could look like creating 30% year over year growth. For some people that could look like being able to just stay where they're at, but be able to double or triple profits. And at this stage, yeah. actually, at the million dollar level, what's gone on, you know, between one and five million, especially and there's there's like a place between 1 million and 2 million especially between well, about 1 and 5 1, 1. 1.1 and um, 1.5 there's like an up and down roller coaster at this point and you're staffing up you're bringing on these new peak team and you're putting in place all, all of these, these these structures in your company but it's costing a lot of money and your profitability is going down so the fear is, is like if i continue scaling our profits going to go worse and the reality yeah. is that it will until you fix the underlining issues of yeah. that. The easiest way to fix that is actually with the offer because that will increase the price increases. That'll increase the, the cash flow and also the profitability because that has to be fixed first. That's the number yeah. one issue why the CEO cannot remove themselves is that. And I still didn't answer your full question. Okay, so <laughs> my takeaway is, which I think you kind of alluded to, it's like, we know the business definition of scale, the way that you see it in a lot of marketing today, it kind of means nothing until you sit down with your client and understand what they mean when they say scale. And sometimes scale actually just means grow. Sometimes scale is just double profits, keep top line the same. Sometimes it's you know, I want to X percent increase over time. The word today, in my opinion, starts to mean has has, means less and less and everyone's going to define it differently. So I was just curious about that. So you said two things that I want to cover. You mentioned price, which I'm actually going to cover second, because one of the things you said was like disconnecting from the time for money model, which is something that we talk a lot about. I want to just kind of, I don't know, riff. I don't really have like a specific, it's like, what do you like, what do you see as this time for money model? Is it bad? How do you say, oh, you're like, how do you move off of what does it look like to not be a time for money model, even in services to you? First of all, I want to actually just address finish. I want to finish what I was saying about the scale before I go into mm-hmm. that. That's sure, okay. sure. Because yeah, yeah. I didn't finish everything I was said on that. And I think there's something to look at when I'm looking at scaling. A lot of times it's going from, you know, one to five, five to 10, whatever that level is that you, this is a lot of times where we're working with a majority of our clients. We have some private clients we work with on the higher level may have the same kind of challenges, but they're, but they need a little bit more customization that comes into selling time for money that we can talk about too. But 
we like to work with people with a big vision that want to create something. Because here's the thing about that is that it's much easier to be thinking big to be able to create a much bigger vision because then you you are forced to, to think so differently than what you're doing right now. And we're at that stage in our company too, where we're actually looking at what is the 10X? What does it take? What is our people? What are our processes at 10X? And that's very different than just 2X. I'm assuming you've started or read the book 10X is easier than 2X. No, but I've been hearing about that, but it really is the case. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm like sixty percent through. And so yes, you're spot on with that. Well, it, 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 <laughs> the biggest thing is it's the mindset. I think I see that as one of the biggest things that's holding that holds people back is that they're thinking too small. And when you're thinking too small, you have very limited ways of, of, of resources. And I think that goes into what you know your question about the time for money model because this is one of the biggest things that keep people trapped in this time for money model. And by the way, there's on some level we're all in a time for money model. Right? right? There's a certain amount of hours, but there, there's nothing wrong with selling your time for money. It's just, you have to be selling it for a lot of money. And yeah. to uh, what you're going to say. Mutual friend, Brad Martineau, he says, it's actually okay to sell your time. Just don't sell it as time. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And that's, I like, I like that one too. It's like, yeah, sell your time, but just sell it for a lot of money or just sell it, but don't sell it as time. Like right. the, the blocks of hours, like, oh my God, stop selling blocks yeah. of hours. Well, what you're, you're, you're doing is, is the therapy model. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's no incentive to actually solve the problem if you're just selling hours because you want them to buy more hours. Clients want a clear, they want certainty. They want a bigger vision than they can see themselves. So when you can be able to help them see a pathway that they weren't able to, to see for themselves, and you know, it might be that 10X pathway, for example. If, if you're able to help them see that, then you have eliminated all the rest of the competition because who else is, who is not thinking like that? They're thinking for like, how can I safely offer these deliverables so that I don't have to overpromise and that I don't have to actually put my neck on the line and actually, you know, break a sweat. Back to the time for money though. It's just a matter about how do you be able to move it from what is inside of your brain to actually within a repeatable process that is not all repeated. It, maybe it's 80% repeatable process. You know, I have I have a client that was just sharing how they're working with these really large organizations, these cultural organizations, museums, some organizations that you definitely would have heard. They're putting together a marketing implementation that supports their membership growth and they do a really amazing job at this. Some they're million dollar deals, some of them. And some of them are in the, you know, multiple six figure range as well. But one of the things that he sh he shared is that it's 90% repeatable. 90% is only 10% customized. So how you get to that point is getting really clear on what is our best work and who who do we do that best work for? What is the biggest outcome? And it's that's the power of ones that I talk about. The very specific client type, not industry, but client type and a specific painful problem. So like million dollar problems, we like solving million dollar problems. And then what is the outcome under those circumstances? How do you, what with the best circumstances, what outcome could you create? And then when you look at the, the, those, those, um, the, that power of ones allows you to be relevant in any market climate. It allows you to be able to charge premium services top level because you can solve a problem better than anyone else. And it allows you to be able to really be known for something that's exceptional. And I know this is something that you and I uh, see eye to eye on. And it's, it's, it's a different way of, of, of thinking. Yeah. It's like going from selling the deliverables to selling the outcome of what those deliverables will actually yield at the end. Right. So this kind of goes into, you made the comment of part of this getting away from time for money is solving a, a painful problem. And you talked about how you know some of your clients are solving like high six, even million dollar plus problems, which obviously would allow you to charge more. Uh, so can you talk about like, you, you made the comment like, you have clients 300% their price. I would guess that you run into there's some mindset hurdles when it comes to raising your price. It's like 70%. Any amount, let alone 300%. <laughs> yes, we do run into mindset issues for sure. This part of our, our system, our irresistible offer intensive, it's a 90 day intensive. We also offer this standalone for companies that are under a million. They have to have really good results. So how do you take really good results and be able to isolate 
who is that profit sweet spot client and mm -hmm. to understand who you can do your best work for under, under the best conditions and then create those conditions and then only accept clients in those conditions. And what that means is that, you know, you and I've had this conversation. It means like yeah. saying no to those kinds of clients that aren't going to be a fit, but it, it doesn't mean that every single client has to fit exactly this criteria, but it allows you to be able to attract in exactly the type of clients that you want to work with. So at a certain point, you will not want to work with any of those other clients because you'll realize these are so much more profitable. You maybe even be able to start transitioning almost all of your clients over to that new way of doing business, which elevates the service for them. It's funny. I was just having a conversation kind of on that topic of being able to say no to someone, right? And like right. having those characteristics of what makes a good client versus a bad client. And what what's interesting and in, in for everyone listening, like Mandy and I have been having this like back and forth, you know, asynchronous <laughs> conversation around our market at all agency and like who her best fit is. And it's funny is like when we help people productize and like our clients oftentimes are optimizing first for lifestyle and like free time. Yeah. Like they want to be scalable and they want to not be the bottleneck in things, but like them exiting or having like t a $10 million business comes way after their ability to like go spend time with their kids because like they haven't been doing that, which for us as we've realized that it's kind of in that like 10 to on the low side a month to like 40, 50K a month. And it's like you find like in that sweet spot, it's like it's a sweet spot for us because they're nimble enough to make some of these changes. But sometimes they're in that position where they almost feel like they can't afford to say no to someone based on this yeah. new criteria. And I would gather, I say all this to say that I'm, I gather that at the level that people are at when they come to you 1.1 and up, they're trying to get to 10. There's probably some sort of stability that they're like, oh, like I, I don't need the next client this second just to make these next moves. Like we're, we're, we're focused on other things. Is that safe to say? No, because I, I the, the same the same things come up over and over again. Same thing. Uh, interesting. Yeah, okay. Because. And I, and even as our clients have, have been successful in this, they've proven the model over and over again. I have a, a board of directors call that I do with our top clients that are our veterans. They've been in there for a while. They have multi-million dollar companies and they've become, you know, some of them have acquired other companies too. They've become quite successful. This private room, we still get to this head trash of like, well, I don't know if I can afford this person. I'm like, I just want to start laughing at them. I'm like, are you yeah. kidding me? Like every time yeah. you've got all these things in place and every time you increase capacity in your company, you fill it every single time. Like, I just need to yeah. remind them that sometimes that like I've because I've seen that like okay over the past five years we have some evidence here should we talk about that and, yeah. and then they realize that like it's in their head and that's one thing that I've learned more than anything and this is what one of our clients who you know it's just skip hopping a jump away from 10 million and he came in at about six hundred thousand. and one of the things that he's shared he's like what the biggest thing that's taken me here is mindset <laughs> I was like first of all I'm like yay I was so excited to hear him say this because like that's definitely not what he would have said even a few years ago but really like almost every problem in business is actually mindset even when you forget you notice yeah. that yeah i think we run into situations and i'm guessing that you do too to some degree it's like all right like this crosses the boundaries of of like business consulting and you just need a therapist you know like <laughs> like there, like there's some of that level of mindset stuff that's like been ingrained in these people myself included mind you from like a very for a very long time ago that like impact how you make decisions both in business and out of business that like i don't know i guess i'm just speaking personally it's like sometimes again i i hear this at rooms that i'm in where it's one to 40 million like in masterminds that i'm in and like so we all have the same issues it's totally mindset foundation but but like all right that's not a problem that i'm equipped to help you navigate at least the first part of it. That's my hate part of it is yeah. I can't be dealing with that. So here's the thing is the fact that you have the awareness of that. And that's one of the big pieces that that's, that's really good for you to know that. So it, it helps you with your clients, right? Yeah. The stage of growth that you're also talking about between 10 and 50,000 a month, that is a whole different level of mindset. And it's one that we've chosen that we don't want to really work with. Under half a million, that's a level of mindset that I'm not I'm not really excited about working with myself. Yeah. I've done it. We've done it successfully, but it's just it is, there's so much mindset there. It, it is one of the hardest stages. So I have to really commend you guys for how effective you are at that stage because you're dealing with operational issues. You're dealing with sales issues, marketing issues, mindset issues, the cluster, you know what. 
And yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> the fact that you have such great success rates just goes to show how effective your services are. Yeah. But at, at the same time, it's still like for those people that are listening that are in that range, like, I don't know, for me, it's at least comforting in some way to know that even people 10 times as big actually still have some of the same mental obstacles. It just comes at a different, a different level, um, which is terrifying too, because it doesn't go away. <laughs> it doesn't go away. But something else I want to point out too is that it's all there. They're just better at hiding it. And I remember yeah. when I was, when we were starting to work with higher level clients as we were moving up, because you got to the place where we found where our sweet spot is. What I discovered is that, like, I remember having a conversation with an agency owner. We had three conversations and he didn't tell me until the third conversation, oh, by the way, our company's not profitable. I'm not paying myself. I'm like, that would have been a good thing to open with, all right? <laughs> I now know how to spot those things and cut right to the chase really quick. What it is, is it just such BS. I'm poking fun a little bit at that, but at the same time, it's real because the, the reality is, is as you get yeah. become more successful, it's actually harder because you're, you have all these people that are looking to you and that you have to keep a strong face for. There's not really a lot of places where you can just go and break down a little bit. And that's part yeah. of the problem too, because, because you have to be able to actually process through these things to be able to, to create a clearing, to be able to create that next level growth. Mm. And that's one of the things that we create with our scale of freedom program is this, this space where everybody in here is really intelligent. You are too. We get that. And it's okay also to not have the answers and to, and to be a little bit of a, of a screw up at the moment. <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's okay to like let that out and, it's, and yeah. have that safe place. With that being said, like we all kind of have these similar these similar mindsets. We kind of go through these different phases. I'm going to kind of go back a little bit to, to some tactical stuff. Like something that we both align with is this focusing on selling outcomes. For the most part, I think it's fewer services, not all the services, possibly right. even a single service or a single offering. Do people at this stage, I'm guessing that some people come to you where like they offer too many things. How do you talk through the like, hey, Offering less is actually going to make your life easier. It's going to make sales easier. Right. It's going to make acquisition easier. Because I know that that's even at our level, like, oh, wait, if I take away most of my offering and focus on this one thing, how am I supposed to get more clients? Like it feels limiting, but obviously right. we both know that it's it's freeing. How do you navigate that for people at that level? First of all, the thing is, is that like, just telling someone is not enough. Even though you and I both know this, we can still run into the same patterns as every other human being that we might work with or around scarcity. And yeah. having that awareness too, that self-awareness of whether we're being in scarcity or whether we're coming from a place of abundance, that's uh -huh. really helpful to, to be observing. Yeah. And if you're in scarcity, really what you're in is fear. And that's okay, yeah. and we experience that, right? Yeah. But it's like, can we act in spite of the fear? Can we act in spite of that? And that's what creates the abundance. That's what allows you to step into that. How we do that, I was, like, I was mentioning a little bit before about the irresistible offer intensive, this process that we walk our clients through and it's systems and mindset because you, the systems alone will not shift it. I remember I learned this, you know, 10 years ago when I was starting this company, it was 11 years ago, actually, I was realizing we had all these great systems, all these like, just do these things. And like, I would recognize that like, it just didn't work. And the reason why is because of the human element. And I didn't know how to shift that. And that was something I had to really learn how to shift. So mm. we, we woven that into our process, especially for how more, a little more analytical folks, because our clients, they're creative, but they also have some of, they're a little more analytical too. And some of, we even work with really highly technical services too. I have a science background, so it's actually kind of fun to do that every now and then. They have to actually see it. So one of the things that we do on our podcast, we have all these case studies of our clients sharing how it worked for them. And what that does is it gives them, it, it gives other agencies a like feeling of like, oh, I can do this. Someone else has already done this. Other consulting companies, mm -hmm. like, I can do this. That's me. And when they mm -hmm. see that now, this company that seemed really limited before, now they can see a pathway. Like for example, Jeff, yeah. he was watching podcast episode from uh, or listening, I guess, from um, Philip. And they, he's like, my company is a lot like that. And he felt so mm. stuck in it. He's realizing that like this really custom service, there is a way to do it. And he went from charging hourly rate, like under $200 an hour hourly rate, because they were doing is surveying and engineering kind of in between the two of them to being able to do a million dollar offer with one of the top companies in Canada. And that came from mindset, but where it started is when we actually broke down the numbers. So one of the things we do this with profit modeling as part of that irresistible offer, and we actually break down what are the different models that they could look like. And sometimes, you know, if they're working with some really big corporate clients, it might actually mean moving down market to have a more profitable offer. Mm. 
It could be charging the same amount for a lower market. It could mean choosing a higher market at a higher price point. We don't know what it is until we actually go in there and find that sweet spot. But when you actually right. see the numbers on paper, then it, the screws start like loosening up and you start, then once we put together this irresistible offer, then they're saying, oh wow, yes, we can actually do this. And it builds confidence around mm -hmm. this really kick-ass offer that they feel excited about going and selling. And then they start bringing it to prospects and they start getting good feedback on it. And they're like, yes, this is it. And then, and then once they make that sale for like twice the amount, there's this like, not going back um, until some of those those other ones come in and they have to like revive it a little bit. But but it, it's about deciding though, drawing along this line of the sand and say, what are we no longer willing to do anymore for clients? What is what is our minimum standards for how we're helping our clients grow? Like our minimum standards is that we want to be able to help our clients add millions of dollars of growth. We want to help them be able to increase their profitability just insanely. And that's our minimum standard. That insanely, I guess it's not very specific, but we want, you know, helping them double their profits is very reasonable, but it's reasonable because we've put our standard here. And that's what we built our processes around doing. And that's who we accept in only people who we know we can do that with. Totally. So you mentioned, well, so first you've, you've said a couple of times and I, I don't think I specifically dove into it. When's the book coming out? Hands off CEO, triple your fees and profitably scale an exceptional consulting agency that grows without you. Boom. So perfect <laughs> from the title. Um, what, like, when's it available? It'll be available in a few weeks. Um, the the okay. um, Kindle version and then the, the print version will be it'll be a little bit longer than that. But if you want a sneak peek of this, we have an executive book summary and agency scalability checklist. Very meaty. It's really concise. And you can download that right now. And it's free if you go to handsoffceo.com forward slash checklist. And it has a whole scalability checklist. It's the same checklist we actually printed up and we handed out to all of our clients that came to our retreat a couple weeks ago. So this is meaty. It's basically just more of what we talked about. Like, um, yeah, yeah. You can see that, like, I, I, I like it. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to reverse into that because like you were just talking about looking at these things and identifying profitability or, or where like through the offer, you might have to move down market and stuff like that. Right. And one of the first parts of your book is around why service businesses struggle to scale. Clearly, we've talked about offer a bunch of times and we see a lot of people talk about it like offer or the lack thereof an offer or a too convoluted or trying to solve too complex of a problem are typical obstacles that a lot of people face that are holding them back from whatever their version of scale looks like. Are there other things that come up besides like, hey, the who and the what of what you do is still too broad? Is there other common things that hold service companies back from growth and scale? Yes, definitely. One of the biggest things is vision and being, we've talked about this, but vision and believing it's impossible. That's like, mm. nothing's going to happen until you actually believe that and you're aligned with it. And you're actually looking for my best pathway to do that. Yeah. The other thing is looking at the business as a lot of scalability solutions. And I'm putting that in, in uh, air quotes, <laughs> is that they're actually operational people who are coming in and focusing on just one narrow silo of the business around operations or applying growth frameworks that their accountability frameworks like EOS, it's a great system, but it, and you can even see, I've got the book right behind me. It's a great system, oh, yeah. but it, it is not a growth strategy. And right. thinking that you putting in place, it, it, it's not telling you how we're actually getting to this. It's just a place to actually put in agreements that you can manage everyone to. But what if they're the wrong agreements? What if it's the wrong offer? And when the people are not performing, how do you actually deal with that? So I, I do think that there is a, some mistakes that are happening when, when people think that they have a growth strategy when they really don't. And they will figure that out eventually. They will figure yeah. that out. I, I know that because we'll have people come to us that says, I tried all these things and helped some of things. It gave us a little bit more order and structure, but we haven't really made the progress. I'm now realizing it's missing some of these things. So a big piece is you have to actually look at the business holistically. And this is something I know you do too, because you have a really good, strong approach in sales and marketing. You can't approach operations without looking at those in the service business. They're not different. It's all the same. We've just yeah. put labels on them to make, that e to make it easier to conceptualize. But the thing is, is that you can't go and solve your operational issues in isolation because 80% of them are actually caused in the sales process. Yeah. It's funny. It's like I talk to some folks who, oh, like why do we at all agency focus so much on both like kind of the holistic client journey? 
Mm. And because when you look at the people that are in that like pre a million phase, like you said, like the problem in operations often happens from what happened in sales. And the problem in sales is something in like capacity issue. They're just so interwoven at that stage. It's like, you got to just get good at consistently selling something to someone over and over and over again, that the whole thing becomes seamless. And so like, yeah, I think that's, that's super interesting on that piece. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point, Greg. Okay, I have one last topic, and I might be making this up. Okay. There was a time where you and I had a conversation. This was early in when we met. Tell me if this never happened and or if it, if it, if it didn't happen between us, but you can speak to it, roll with it. And we were talking about the when a lot of agency owners, service-based businesses, by the time they get to the million, two, three, like the the low, you know, low seven figures, and they're like, they've been on this mission to build something that runs without them and they want to exit. And they get there and they're like, all this effort, all this time to find out that it's actually not sellable <laughs> because of a lot of the things that we've already been talking about, and they're burnt out and that they like it would require another two to three years to make it something of value. Right. Um, I feel like we had that conversation. Did we or did we not that at some point? Familiar. It sounds like yeah. something that, I would, that I've talked about it's, before. Can you talk to that from the lens of, and, and maybe this is just like uh, when I think of people that we help and a lot of the folks that watch this channel, and I'd say even again, the people that are 2 million and they want to get to 10 or 15, if you have this desire, like the, the destination is for a lot of our clients to get to a million, some of your clients maybe it's get to 10. And so you have the clear destination, but you don't get real with where you're at right now. It's almost impossible to create an executable plan to get there. Thus, you live in like fantasy land. Right. And I think right now, especially the pre-million folks, because of the marketing that we see, it's very easy to be bought into this seven-figure dream agency that runs and operates without you. And so I think a lot of people are, even early days, fixed on this target with not a real sense of what that actually means when they get there, which is why I'm trying to get started on what we work on with these people earlier so that they don't get to a million and they're like, oh, I'm not willing to go another three years. Like I'm already in hell. I'm, right. And then they walk with nothing. And so I just would love your take on like maybe some of the conversations you've had with folks that kind of come to you maybe at that stage and maybe yeah. paint a little bit clearer of a picture for those that have this aspiration. How much of a reality is it that they could sell? What's required to be sellable? What are agencies and services like this even going for this at like? Okay. I know a lot, a loaded question. Yeah, but a like, lot of questions there. Yeah. Um, Okay, so first of all, the best time to actually put the right structures in place is exactly the place where you're talking about when you're working yeah. together with them. You know, so we've talked about our, our business model is not set up very well to be able to, to do that. We've done it in the past. It's not really where our sweet spot is. It's where your sweet spot is too. So that's that's great that you're, you're helping them to, to do that. And there is this, like a million dollar company is not for everyone. And the reality is, is a lot of agencies will get to a million dollars and they're not making very much money. And they might right. even be like, this is what it looks like. It's like, I can't even tell you how many times I have conversations with people like, I, well, we have a healthy profit margin. We ended up not making any money last year because I paid myself like too much. So this year we, we, I paid myself less and now we have a healthy profit. No, that's not how that works. The reality yeah. is the year before when you, you actually, if you paid yourself 150 and your market rate is 200, you're actually negative $50,000 profit. You have to think of right. it that way. The thing is, is that to, to accurately look at your profitability, you need to look at how much you would be making if you were employed by someone else or if you were to replace your role in, in the business. Like that is the key reason why the businesses are not sustainable and why the CEO is working too much because they're taking on way too many roles because there's not enough money to pay for those. So the best time to fix that is earlier on when you're doing it. Best case scenario, if someone shows up to us, their company is in the low seven figures and they say, we've already niched down, we found our, our perfect target market, but you know we're just overwhelmed with work and we have a whole lineup of clients. That would be the most ideal scenario, but you know we have to meet people where they're at. And the right. reality is, is that most of them don't have an ideal target market. They have a range. Mm -hmm. Some of them have, they, they have a lot of opportunities to get more business, but a lot of them have been so busy in the day to day that they don't have a lineup of, of clients. So there's a lot of things to sort out right. even at that level. Now, as far as making it sellable, a lot of people will come to us after giving someone 
comes up and gives them their, their agency like a really soft like offer. Like we want to buy your agency. And really what it means is we're going to give you this offer and then we're going to keep chewing you down until like a year from now, when you are totally exhausted by this process, you are now just like emotionally checked out and we can lowball you and we can take your business for a song. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put all the systems and processes and people and the right offers in place. And we'll probably utilize you and your skill set for the next one to two to three years as a buyout clause. That's really what the kind of offer is you most likely will get if your business is so dependent on you. There's outliers. I'm happy to be be wrong on those things. But when someone comes to you with an offer, I just want everyone to hear this. If you have a million dollar company or any other company, they're, they're coming to you with an offer. You're totally stuck in the day to day. Just recognize that there's a whole lot of due diligence that has to happen before that offer is going to come. So don't get too excited about it until you actually, and also recognize the amount of time and energy that you put into dealing with all their due diligence and things. You could put in that same amount of effort into actually growing your company and putting in place the structure that make it add value that will double your business, literally can double your business valuation over 12 months. And we've seen that with one of our clients in the, the low seven figures and him stepping out of the day to day, him being able to grow the company, grow their cash reserves, all of these things, it strengthened the business so much that it increased the sellable value of it. There's other things that you can do to increase the value of it too, but that's just like on a baseline. I, I talk about that in my book. There's one, there's, there's something that they can really dramatic, they can dramatically increase the multiple. Um, if we have time, we can talk about that. Just to that multiple piece, like we'll kind of start using this to wrap up because they should just go get the book. But <laughs> if there's anything you can share, like you just said, hey, a lot of people that get to a million, they're not even profitable. At a minimum, it's going to take 12 months to probably put in some of these things to become a more valuable company. Whatever the top offer that you might get, know that after due diligence, which by the way, can take a year long uh, and a lot of your time, energy, and effort is probably going to be a lot less than what they originally offered once they do the due diligence. I'm just trying to paint a picture and not like to like discourage someone from doing this, but I do think that there is some false uh, faith fantasy of like, oh, I'm going to do this. And in, in 24 months, I'll be able to sell it. And the reality is that most businesses in general, let alone agencies, mathematically do a do not hit a million <laughs> B, like, don't sell. <laughs> and C, like you, when you look at what some of these at least ones that I've talked to that have exited, you could, again, argue to your point that, okay, well, with the earn out, and these things that are going to be required of you, you're still going to need money in the next three or four years. This is not like a you're set for life sort of situation, no. uh, especially if you're exiting when you're below five. So a sense of reality check in more of a, hey, know what you're getting yourself into. If you're down this path because you think this thing is going to happen, I would love to help people just kind of have a clear sense of setting better expectations because I think a lot of people are making some false promises out there. Totally. Yeah, they're, they're, they really are. I know it's sexy to be able to think about you sell your business and you feel like so good and accomplished about that. And it's also, you know, a bit of an ego stroke when you have, have companies reaching, you know, VCs reaching out to you about those things. The thing is, is that if I was to go and buy an undervalued agency, I would look for an agency that had all the right pieces, basically everything that we look for in our clients. I mean, one way to look at it is we're looking at undervalued assets that we could be able to help elevate to a level where it is an asset that is extremely valuable and it, it, it generates this company that generates a really nice profit margin so that it's a fun business to actually run so that you don't really want to sell. The best exit is one where you actually exit yourself out of all of the stuff in the business business that you don't want to do and where you just design it to be able to do the most fun things and only the most fun things. Mm -hmm. And it takes something to get there. I'm not going to lie and say that this is just like there, there's some magic bullet. Anyone who tells you right. there's a magic bullet or like tries to oversimplify it and say this is only sales or only more, we're going to scale your sales without talking about your mm -hmm. operations or we're going to streamline your operations without taking a look at the, the offers without having respect for what the, the actual impact that you can do. If they're not having respect for that, like you need to take it, really take a consideration if that is a direction that you want to take your company. I hope that that helped it as far as yeah, that yeah, helped. yeah. I think there's a there's a chapter called the five CEO exits, right? Yes, that will cover some of this. Which to the one of them I'm gathering is the exit of you just exit the day to day oh. of all these things and you get to do the stuff that you like. So why even sell? Because it's it's turning out the money that you want and the lifestyle that you want. Well, um, and, and I want to add one last thing on this if I can. Yeah. 
Because here's the thing is I'm, we're talking about some of the hardships around this and everything, right? But yeah. the reality though, is if you take the right steps in the right order, you can dramatically improve the, the amount of time that you have to focus working on the business, the amount of growth. You know, one of our yeah. clients, Tom, he was able to double his agency in seven months after three years of stagnation. You know, and now yeah. he has a multi-million dollar company that's really profitable. He increased his profitability 600%. During those first few months though, I, what happened is that there was a family emergency where he like had to run and be gone for almost a month. And this was mm. previously at a point where his business, it really would have been hard. He would have, they would have really struggled without him there. That was a catalyst that allowed the company to get to a whole new level. So there, there are times, and this comes down to the mindset. There was no other option except for making it work this way. And his team stepped up and they were able to do incredible things. And we see this all the time with clients that have had different reasons where they've really had to be out of the business. So I, I have seen absolute miracles happen in a matter of months. So don't feel discouraged that if you're in, in a hard place, if you are committed and you are willing to make it, make it work, you can really create some tremendous change in a very short amount of time, or you can make tremendous change in a longer period of time. It just depends on what your pace is and what feels good to you and what assets you already have to utilize in your business already. And, or you could do both, make tremendous change in the short term and the long term. <laughs> Love it. That's the way, that's, um, yeah, that's the way to, to think about it, Greg. Mandy, thank you so much for spending your time with us, guys. Check out the book. Uh, hands off CEO. Uh, she's made an awesome checklist and resource available to you at the hands off CEO.com slash checklist, right? Yep. Forward slash checklist. Yep. Check it out. We'll have to have you back because as we've demonstrated now two times, we can clearly talk for hours. Uh -huh. Um, and I hope you guys, uh, enjoyed this check Mandy out and we'll see you guys on the next one.